Let's give Ronald Reagan a good praying for today. He needs a good Pentecostal healing. He's got a great, great responsibility on his shoulders to try to keep this country at peace, keep it moving forward, keep us with jobs and homes and a low interest rate. Let's pray for him this morning that God will heal his body. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, merciful, gracious, powerful, heal his body and cleanse his flesh of that evil cancer, Lord. Touch him and heal him and lay your hand upon him now. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, heal him and bless him in Jesus' name. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank you so much, and please be seated. I'd like you to give me your imagination here for a moment. This would represent a radiator common to all combustion engines. Uh, One pours water in the top and fills these tubes, goes into the block. It cools the magnificent heat that's in that block and is returned up to the top of the radiator core and a water pump down here keeps that circulating and moving. This is also an interesting observation about communications. Never ever once in human history has everybody ever poured capital A, capital B, capital C in a human ear and it came out capital A, capital B, capital C. That's an impossibility. It has never happened. It never will. Because there are so many polyps, there's so many leaks, there are so many crooked veins, there are so many deeply hidden psychological barriers to communications within our mind, within our conscience, within our heart, within our spirit, and with our soul, that capital ABC spoken By the time it gets into us and is regulated and adjusted and compensated for by what prejudices and mistakes which are held for truths, by the time they chemically react with that, it comes out not capital ABC, but maybe RLS, what we thought we heard. The apostle warned of that. He said, if you hate your brother, if you have that constriction down here in these cores, you will walk in darkness. The prophet said you'll stumble on the mountains. What a speaker can do for an audience depends a great deal more on what chemicals and factors are in this radiator than what he puts in there. A church that's carnal and prayerless, where divisions and disharmonies are allowed. You can put in any amount of voltage up here, but it will be restricted to a mere buzz by the time it gets out. A church that isn't praying, a church that doesn't keenly and carefully and sincerely honor their bishop, their pastor, their shepherd, He can give all his life fervently and earnestly and wear out his wife and destroy his children and come out a disappointed, bitter, bent old man with a very small, minimum, net positive result. So the Bible said, out of the heart proceed the issues of life. And we are taught to keep our heart with thorough, total diligence. The word keep here may be an agricultural word, like a man keeps sheep or like you keep your garden. Uh, Keeping the heart requires a great deal of weeding, a great deal of adding nutrition, fertilizers, and water, and it's a full-time job, keeping the heart. So what I have to say here today If somebody's putting that on magnetic tape, it will come out A, B, C on magnetic tape because magnetic tape cannot hate, 
It cannot doubt. It cannot suspicion. It cannot exaggerate. It cannot over or under evaluate or estimate. It's just like you put it in. But make no mistake, the heart, and you've got one, is desperately wicked. And who can know it? So good luck to you <laughs> as you approach the judgment. Best wishes. I wonder if some fine young man would come up here and help me keep this board erased when I need it and not make me turn my back to my friends. Would you do that? Here's a fine young man. All you got to do is just keep that erased. There's a handkerchief right down there that would do since I don't see an eraser. Now, you come right up here, and you can get your chair right over there in front of the organ, and when I'm ready for you, hop up there, and uh, you can practice right now getting rid of that. Oh, did you, did you feel the billows of sincerity and earnestness that Brother Tenney poured out here last night? Speaking of the great burden of his heart last night. Oh, my, my, my. If we could all comprehend and understand the meaning, the fervency of just what we were hearing last night, we we're fortunate to have that kind of preaching in any meeting. Fortunate, blessed, it to be envied. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 44. This will be a chapter of a book that I hope to leave when I'm gone called Let the Kings Tell Us. It's uh, biographical sermons on the book of Kings. First Kings chapter 22 and verse 44. You can remember that because 22 doubled is 44. First Kings 22, 44. My subject today is the peacemaker. I intend that this will be an indirect essay, effort, force, to helping you achieve revival in your life and in your church. I won't be preaching about revival. I love revival. I love growth. I'm eaten up with any hope of seeing it. I want it. But I think that lack of peace is a mighty deterrent to a worldwide, all-races revival. I do. I think it's a chunk that has to be removed if we ever move forward. And it takes peacemakers to do it. Verse 44, And Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Very brief statement. You bet he made it. If he had it, he got it. If he got it, he made it. Because Ahab was a first-class dingbat, practiced, polished, flying high turkey. It's a wonder that Jezebel herself could stand him. And it's a wonder he could stand her. <laughs> War was his cup of tea. Burning villages, pillaging, raping, taking little children into slavery, taking young girls into white slavery, erecting places to worship other gods, cheating his people, over-taxation, oppression, a vile, villainous bandit. He would have made a good secretary and treasurer for the mafia. But Jehoshaphat, being next-door neighbor, made peace with him. Peace makes good sense. Peace, peace makes good economics. You'll live longer in peace. You'll live better in peace. Got a lot better chance of being in the rapture if you live in peace. I want to define my terms a bit. When I say peace, I mean the cessation of previous hostilities. 
I mean what was in an uproar, what was in a fight, what was in a row, what was in a roar, comes to an acceptable, happy solution. Comes to an honorable getting along. And this man, Jehoshaphat, made peace with Ahab. Uh, it's like saying, who could make peace with Fidel Castro? He isn't thought of as a man of peace. Uh, it's a good deal like uh, saying, who could make peace with uh, the Prime Minister of, of Israel? Tough, unyielding. But here comes Anwar Sadat, the little black Egyptian with a big heart and a comprehension of the financial and economic and political value of peace. And so he comes down and goes into Tel Aviv and walks into the Knesset and speaks in front of the Israeli parliament and says, let's have peace. And he got it. In my view, that's a very important thing in our day. Uh, I want to urge you to... Let me help you with this business of making peace. There's not necessarily anything to you if you are just such a person that peace can be made with. Some people may prize themselves and say, well, if he'd come over here and straighten things up, bless God, I'd treat him right. You're worth two bits. But the man is golden. The man is valuable. I'll show you where Jesus said the man is blessed, who is the maker, the initiator, the guy who takes it in the neck, the guy who ducks, blows when he's trying to make peace, the guy who zips his lip when they insult him, when they put him off, when they object to any venture of sincere attempt to make peace. Now, David... <clears throat> really wasn't the peacemaker. He was a warrior. He said he was for peace, but not really. When Naboth insulted him, it made him so angry. He said, I'll get him. And he would have made himself a name as a tyrant, as a bandit, as a sheik of the desert thirsty for blood, had it not been for precious little Abigail, who ran down there to the crossing and said, Oh, my Lord, who am I to tell you what to do? But if you do this, you'll earn an unending name of shame. Don't you do it. And he had sense enough to listen to a woman. That's one of the greatest faults among the world today, is that men don't listen to women. Well, it took God to convince Abraham to listen to Sarah. He went and told on Sarah. God said, hush, go do what she told you to do. Well, it's written right there in the Scripture, had David not listened to this woman, he would have shamed himself forever. But he sensed that she had her feet on the ground, and she was with it, and she had it together, and that she cared about both camps, and she effected, she created, she manufactured, she arranged peace. She was a peacemaker. Well, when you talk about Israel up here on the northern part of the country and you talk about Judah down here, keeping these people out of each other's throat had been a difficult job. There had been a long history since the separation of the states of war between Israel and Judah. A long history. And when histories are long, they tend to carry over, uh, what do we call that, uh, a momentum. But when Jehoshaphat came to the throne, he looked around and he said, Look, we can have hell on earth every spring. We can burn their villages and they can go home and find their homes in little slithers of mystic smoke. We can go home and they can find their sons lying out with slit throats and their, their women with children slit up and there lays the fetus and there lays the mother. We can keep on doing that. We've been doing it. Some for them, some for us. And we can neglect our 
fields of wheat and barley and oats and rye and corn and lentils and beans and our pineapples and our fruits. We can send our young men away every spring like we've always done and let them come back maimed, without feet, without legs, without arms, with bandages over their hearts. And we can nurse them all fall long and then in the wintertime when the snows have come and it's too late to raise any grain, then they're able to get up and draw a little water. And we can go to war again next spring and beat and kick and snort and buck and bite, burn, curse, yell, get our emotions up, bellyache, gripe, insist you did wrong on that point and I'm going to have your hide, you stand still, I'm going to scalp you. They could have done that forever. But some, a brain came along. Bless God for a few brains. A brain came along. And he said to himself, I don't want to spend my life doing that. If I reign here 40 years, I don't want to spend 40 years killing all my choice young men who could be collegiate material, who could be trained, who could be taught, who could enter the arts, who could enter the sciences, who could enter government, who could be great agriculturalists. I don't want to kill all my young men out there fighting these other fellows. And so he purposed in his heart that he would make peace. And it's written in the eternal word of God to his justification and honor that he made peace with, would you believe it, Ahab. Now, I don't think it'd be a big trouble to make peace with Margaret Thatcher. I think she's sensible, agreeable. I think she's got it all together. I think she's on her feet. But now, Gorbachev. He is in Europe at the moment with all his forces because he knows that our, our cloud in Europe is lower than it has been in the last three decades. He knows that the, the Italians and the French and in Holland and other, even in Britain, he knows that our stock is on the bottom. It's a depression stock market as far as America is concerned in Western Europe. And so he's patching fences by the mile. Now, if he does that, if he can disenchant Europe, Western industrialized Europe from the United States, he can handle us with power steering. And then if he can get Mexico all upset and get Canada all upset, uh, you know, he's, he's done something in his administration. But Jehoshaphat, that blessed one who did know God and who honored God, God and his word and honored the prophets, the brain came along and he said, look, we can keep this up, but if we do, the, the gross national product is going to be so low, there are going to be so few acres of grapes and raisins, there's going to be such high prices for bread, and our people are going to go home year after year after year to burned homes and burnt smokehouses and burnt barns. About the time we get our harvest ready, an invading army is going to come and take all this grain we've worked for this year. And it's, it's just, it just don't make sense. No way, Jose. And so he said, the thing to do is make peace. Now, I want to tell you that a peacemaker is a rare character. If we ever find one, we ought to put him in a pure vinyl, put him in... He, he, he's going well, to save him for seed. We ought to graft off of him. If we can find a peacemaker. You ought to be one. Let's read what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 9. May I have a reader from the audience? Good and loud. This building is pretty big. Uh, man or woman, anybody, Matthew 5 and 9. The blessed words of Jesus. Thank you. Blessed, to be envied, fortunate, to be admired, are the peace what? The what makers? How about the fuss boxes? How about those brave, courageous, contentious people that's going to have it their way because they're right? Is that what he's talking about? Or did he say, blessed are the peacemakers? For well, they shall be called the children of God. Jesus Christ put a high premium on this talent of being able to create 
rest where there's been unrest, to create strength where there has been a constant decay of energy, to create tranquility where there's been upset, uproar. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a farmer and I have several tractors and I'm interested in that kind of junk. Let's just say here, here's a transmission. I have some tractors with several, several gears and several ratios. Some of them have several different knobs on them, you know. Uh, all these transmissions need a reverse. And the, the uh, what do you call that on a the gear? These uh, gizmos here, in one way, they look that way. And the same size gear, if these treads are cut the other way, it becomes a reverse gear. Okay. Uh, well, if you want to have some dangerous fun, like getting somebody killed, you just lift this lid. This lid, lid's usually tied down with about eight bolts. You just take these gear boxes off, gear levers off, and just take that out and slip these off this main shaft back here. And while he's not looking, you just take one of these that's turned that way and turn it around and put it up here. And this tractor driver that's used to scooting right on down the field, he puts that and he leans forward, you know, to get ready to go forward, and <laughs> backwards he goes. All the energy that would have propelled him forward will throw him backwards. He does the same thing he always does. He gives acceleration, lets out on the clutch, but instead of going forward, it goes backwards. Now, there are some people that come from the factory wired up wrong. These little gizmos here are turned backwards on the shaft. Paul had some of that in his own gearbox. He said, when I would do well, evil is present. When I start out from the north, I find myself in the sunny south. Huh? Very few things in this world come from the factory right. Let's say this here is a washing machine, you know. And there's all kind of little wires going back here. Well, a fellow came to work drunk one day and put this yellow wire over here where this blue one was. You know? I had a friend one time who bought a 1957 Buick that was wired up wrong from the factory. Uh, when he blew the horn, the door uh, glass started coming down. <laughs> really? It was a 1957 Buick Century, and the gas tank fell off in his driveway. When he would open the door, the lights would come on. Uh, it was just pitiful. And I want to tell you, in case you don't know, that that's the meaning of depravity in the Bible. When you got here, you was wired up wrong. When you hatched and you hit the floor, uh, you were wrong. Because of a curse that was on the race. And until you get a good pastor who simply evermore knows what he's doing, and will set you down and stop you and get your attention and get your affection and get your loyalty and get your love and get your trust and let him pull these wires out, you're in trouble. Let me tell you what a guy that knew what to do did for me the other day. Thanks for that. I had a 5020 John Deere that I had just spent $11,000 on redoing the engine in it. We blew the engine. Oh. I did survive. <laughs> the guy that put it back together was a regular farm shop employee of ours. And I said, look, Davis, when you take that down, take a Polaroid picture here before you tear that engine down. And as you go, take pictures of it so that you'll know exactly how to put that thing back together. I, I didn't have any idea I was going to end up spending $11,000 rebuilding that engine. I would have never, ever have done it. The tractor is not worth that. Okay, he took these pictures. He put it back just like those pictures said. And the, the foreman told him, he said, Davis, I don't look right to me. He said, there's the picture. That's the way it is. That's the only one way this can go back together and it be right. And uh, he said, well, okay. Well, when they got ready to put it on steam, I said, I want to drive it myself. So I came out to one of the fields and I hooked a big heavy disc behind that thing. Wow, did that thing smoke. I went in and called the John Deere man. He said, don't worry about it. It'll quit smoking in a few minutes. Just shower down on it. I went back to the field and I showered down on it. That thing smoked, smoked, smoked. 
And in a few minutes it quit. But there came a new terrific noise in that engine. <laughs> so I called a man that I had an awful lot of confidence in, a professional. He came out there and he looked and he said several little words I'm not going to say. He said, how could any idiot have ever put these fuel lines in this sequence? Oh, I said, hey, I've only operated less than an hour. What do you think I've done? He said, you probably have to rebuild the whole engine again. He said, now, if there's real luck, he said, if you didn't drive it very long, he said, I'll try this. He said, one time in my life, he said, I've seen this happen. I was saying, hey, old Mary, Mother of God, help us now. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I, I, it would have just got pushed in the river. We wouldn't have never put another nickel in that tractor, but we needed it so badly at that time of preparation. He put those lines back. He said, you probably have some cylinder scarring, but said, you can live with that. And you know, a great smile came on that man's face after he'd run the engine about three or four minutes. And you know, that engine doesn't use any oil. It doesn't smoke. It don't, it don't rattle. He just moved one line back from where the other one was. Which is to say that there's some things that had better be right or force destroys itself. What happened, we found out later, that the last guy that had worked on that tractor was a novice and he had failed to take a picture before he disconnected it and put it back wrong. And that's why the engine blew up. That's what I learned for $11,000. I'll tell you what, friends, when you get past 50, tuition comes high. Like, ha! <laughs> uh, you don't need much war-likeness about you to ruin you. For God can't use much of that. David had war all his ministry, all his service. But his boy came along, and he had peace all his administration. And it was then that prosperity and breakthroughs and growth and culture and the better life came. Now, there are some people who have characterized a long ministry distinguished by church trouble. Distinguished. That's the noteworthy feature of their ministry. They have trouble everywhere they go. Warlikeness, it doesn't take much of that to really hurt you. If I were to make a cake here this afternoon, if I were to choose a white cake with a coconut topping, uh, you'd say, whew, does that sound good or does that sound good? Well, I didn't tell you, but I'm going to put a half a teaspoon of kerosene in the mix. I ran it all. There are some things it doesn't take much of, does it, to cheapen life to make it in disorder. You put a teaspoonful of diesel, of water in a gallon of diesel, and you've really got some enormous troubles. It doesn't take much water mixed with diesel to give you trouble. I could take my grandson's balloon and blow it up and I say, here, baby, uh, this is what Big Daddy's got for you, and he could just be so thrilled, but I say, I want to adjust this toy just a little bit. I've got a needle here, and I want to put you one nice little hole in it, baby. Just enough to stick this needle through. And after a while, that thing, it lay, lay there like an alligator with AIDS. Just, just ruined. Ruined. Nothing to it. Just that much. Just a small hole. You can get that one now. <laughs> Thank you. But we're looking, beloved, at what is said here, that Jehoshaphat made peace with Ahab. Making peace with some people is, is easy. With others, the apostles say, follow peace with all men as much as in you is possible. Uh, you will lack the numbers and the strength and the talent to make peace with some people. But let's pray you don't meet them in the next ten years. Let's pray that everybody you have to do with, that God will give you the character and the ability, the dedication, the consecration, whatever it takes to make peace with everybody in all your circumstances and situations. 
Uh, I, I want to say that peace has a very different value to different people. Uh, to some folks, peace would be in the sense, per pound. Uh, to other people, peace would be in the $100,000 bracket per pound. These people here have what is called kidneys, spelled B-R-A-I-N-S. These people here are boorish, beastly. The common word for that is carnal. Depending on the quality of your inward living, depending on the metering and the measuring of what you are inside, all of us will have a bit different estimate of the value of a pound of peace. For polite, for cultured, for interested, for productive, for creative people who love and who live and who are godly, Peace is the ultimate value. For bandits, for sheiks, for convicts, for mafia characters, for hardheads, for troublemakers, peace is a bother. And somewhere on this scale of two cents to $100,000 is where I live. There's something that'll get me going. There's something that'll fuzz my hair. There's something that will get me angry. Something that will bring me into combat. There's something that will make me welcome conflict at some place. And there's something that will make you into conflict and to bitterness and to using your few precious units of energy, throw them into a hole, throw them into fire, throw them into the water. As the devil cast this precious young man and cast him into the fire or cast him into the water. Somewhere you have a threshold of activity towards aggressiveness. And depending on how well you have trained yourself, I sure appreciate you doing that. I like you. Uh, Depending on how well you have redeemed yourself and consecrated yourself and refined yourself, that level goes up and down. I heard a blessed old preacher say over there at Brother Howard Davis's, this old preacher that you had over there that I love so well, He said he was 75. What's his name? Old brother from Oklahoma. He said one time in his presentation, yeah, (laughs) Brother Mark Boffman, he said, I found out that as I get older, my body slows down a rat smart. And he said, I found out my nerves picks up a rat smart. (laughs) Well, (laughs) that may affect this uh, threshold movement up and down of where you are going to be. But then your heredity uh, may have something to do with where your threshold of fight is. The Hatfields and the who? McCoys. Just said, want to see if you was listening. Let's say M-C-C-O-W. That looks like Macau. C-O-Y. Okay, Hatfields and McCoys. Now, if your name is Hatfield or McCoy, you may have some pretty heavy blood in you. You may need the prayer room every night, you know. Uh, You may need the frequent confession of your fault in order to be healed of it. If you're very mild, you may be uh, blessed. But don't mistake that mild genetic help for the work of the Holy Spirit. If you just happen to lean towards peaceableness, it's not that you don't need to hear God's Word about this today. If it's already easy with you to be peaceable, you're not exempt from making an attempt to be more peaceable. Uh, The value of peace varies a great deal between families and between between personalities. Um, I want to show you something that uh, was interesting to me. This is the map of a marriage. I don't start out like that. Come race that. Thank you. Uh, it starts very different. Here's the girl and here's the boy. And they meet somewhere in college or campus or in church or camp meeting or youth camp or somewhere. They come together, uh, beer joint, wherever they met. 
Uh, it's just a picture of marriage, not necessarily this. And then they decide that they must have each other and they want each other and to make a pledge of mutual support and happiness and they live together for a while. And then this curve begins to widen, uh, sleeping husbands while children cry, uh, wives that don't take care of themselves anymore and husbands that get interested in playing football with the boys on Saturday afternoon and these things just get worse and worse, and he gets the Holy Ghost, and she don't like that at all. And uh, we just there, there comes a revival frequency as the children get real sick, and he gets a raise, and she sees that's uh, going to be a benefit, so they come back together <laughs> again. <laughs> but this is the, the map of a marriage. But at 20 years... In some instances, this, these things begin to get farther and farther away. Uh, God, it's quiet in here. <laughs> Are you all all having your 20th anniversary this year? At this point, you have the option of saying, it's hopeless. Or you can say, I believe in truth. I believe in the Word of God. You can say, just like God brought Eve to Adam, you can say, God brought this woman to me. This is God's choice. The steps of a good man are chosen by the Lord. He knew and ordained and elected our lives before we ever knew Him or cared for Him. He was arranging the beautiful affairs of our life. And we say we don't believe in separation. We don't believe in divorce. And so the wife takes a stand and said, you, you, you bother me. You really abuse me. You hurt me. And it's, it's, uh, you don't understand me. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm suffering in this relationship, but we're going to stay together. God, it's quiet in this place. It's quieter here than it would be in an Eskimo's igloo when he's dead ten years. Here we go. At this point, the husband has the option of saying, I saw a good-looking little redhead, and she was alone. And the secretary, she's a divorcee, too. He's got an option of making a tom fool out of himself. He's got an option of strangling a marriage, committing a murder, a marriage consists of two factors. A human life consists of one. This is immensely more important than this. If keeping your marriage together chokes you to death, keep it together. Well, at this time, if these people put their feet down and say, no, some way, somehow, by the grace of God, then this thing can go back and until their 50th anniversary. It can look like this, the first love. A restoration. Go ahead and race that quick. <laughs> Peace makers. Uh, let us look at uh, one of the supreme mountaintops of Numbers chapter 6 and 26. This has been one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture that I have in my lifetime ever enjoyed. This is a ceremonial confrontation done on a daily basis between the ordained priest and the believer. When the believer seeks to worship, when he offers his offering, he comes before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. This is the memorized, merciful greeting. This is the statement of policy that God gives through his employee, the priest. Let's start reading there at verse 24. May I have a reader, please? The Lord bless thee. I'll get this. Uh, read a, a verse ahead, Elder, please, uh, above that. A, a verse before, verse, tw verse 23, is that where it begins? Speak unto Aaron. Okay. Son, yes. Saying, on this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them. Now this is the formula, on this wise, saying unto them, all right? Let's all repeat that. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. No, I don't like it that way. I want in a bit of a chant. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Now, ain't none of you ever been Catholics? 
Look, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. Good. Are you Italian? Good. I like that. Would you be embarrassed to do that again? All right, let's hear it. Let's see if I can do that. Help me. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Next. Good. It's fun, isn't it? Okay. Hey, let's all stand up just a minute. You may be getting tired. Something's wrong with you. I'll try that. <laughs> okay, you can be seated again. Maybe that'll help you feel a little better. Now, seriously, the book of Lamentations and the book of Song of Solomon were originally chants. We have missed something by never learning to chant. A number of New Testament salutations and greetings and farewells in the New Testament probably were beautifully executed chants in the New Testament church. Uh, Brother Robert Lafleur said one time when he first received the Holy Ghost way back there in the teens of this century that uh, he read in the Scripture to, that we should dance before the Lord. Well, he took that and so he brought his French harp to church and he danced up on the platform. And he said... He was mistaken. I rather think he was exactly on target. I really do. I think if we had continued that, instead of just muscular gyrations that we're permitted to do today, I think some beautiful, beautiful orderly dances would bring praise, majesty, distinction, and dignity to our great God. I really do. Uh, I don't know why I said that. Uh, brother, read that first part again now. Uh. Yes, sir. Deacon to Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Boy, boy, boy. That pulverizes me. That seizes me. That gouges me. I love that. The Lord give thee peace. Now, there's some folks after hamburgers and horses, but the elite of the world are after peace. Some want gold. Some want stocks. Some want bonds. Some want equity. Some want documentation, papers, and currency. But sensible people, as an ultimate wish, is peace. The Lord bless thee, the Lord keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee. The Lord lift his face up upon thee and grant thee peace. The ultimate lifestyle, peace. Let us go farther in the scriptures now to Psalms 119, 165. Psalms 119, 165. What is your threshold of peace? What will get you going? What will ring your bell? What will blow your horn? What will cause you to reach and draw? What will cause you to sharpen your knife? What will cause you to gouge somebody? What will cause you to hook? Hey, boy, I wish I had some steps around here, man. Could get down. I, my age, I dare not jump that no more. <laughs> I don't have major medical. Hey, uh, it is a, you know, I'm a farmer. I, I just can't get it out of my mind. Some people have corpuscles. I have cowpuscles. It's in my blood. Uh, in the Old Testament, if an ox was seen goring, he must die. Not a bull. It's as natural for a bull to gore and fight as it is for a rooster to go barefoot. But an ox has been changed. The biology that contributed to his aggressiveness and don't care attitude have been removed. He is a steer. And if he is seen goring, we can't have that in the Israeli society. Something went wrong. Some pumping of hormones has come back behind his horns and he wants to butt again. An ox is supposed to chew his cud and stand there. 
uh, anybody would know that a bull is not expected to do that. And if you expose yourself to a bull, a Holstein bull, a brown bull, Jersey bull, Hereford bull, well, you're asking for it. But a gentle old ox that's been with the family, the babies go get him, the babies lead him in, the babies feed him, they, they wash him, they trim his hoofs, they harness him. He ain't hurt nobody. But if he starts goring, there's something wrong and he must be removed from society. We are oxen. We've been changed. Our nature has been arrested. We don't get the same hormones the world gets. We are peaceable, easily be entreated. We had rather suffer wrong than to wrong a brother. We've been changed. But when something happens that a Christian starts warring and contending and fighting and fussing and insisting and undermining and whispering and separating saints from their pastor, there's something mighty bad going wrong. Mighty bad. Irregular. Indecent. Accidental. And somebody better catch him and do something to him. All right. Where were we? Uh, did we get that scripture in Psalms? No. Psalms 119.165. Would a volunteer read that? What do they have? How much? Great peace. Oh, I like that. Great, extensive, expansive, exhaustive, common. Uh, beyond ordinary peace, great peace, great in quality, great in extent, great in duration, great in power, great in its influence, great peace have they that love thy law. Yeah, he'll fight at the drop of a hat. Did you ever hear that? That's not who we're talking about. Wish I could have heard that remark, Brother Tenney. What did you say? Woohoo! Short fuse. Uh, got that nature from daddy. Got that nature from daddy. Oh, oh, that's a Choctaw in him, huh? It's a Cajun in him. That's the Italian in me. Well, Italians can get the Holy Ghost. Cornelius did. But I think it would only be fair to the truth to say that Cajuns do have propensities to evils that uh, other groups do not. I think it's only fair to admit that blacks have propensities to evils that Caucasians do not. I think it's correct to acknowledge that the Hispanic society has weightiness and leanings towards certain evils that others do not. I think Jamaicans are suspect more commonly on certain things. So whatever you are, get it under the blood. Oh, dear God, I did kick that dog slam off the porch at my place the other night. I told them that, uh, you know, we have a, a highly mixed congregation in Houston. We have 25 or more black families, about 40 uh, Hispanic families, we have Korean families, Vietnamese, Choctaw, Cherokee, have a few white folks. Uh, I, I told them, and you know, this old man once in a while, he, I, my head gets afire. And I said, I want to tell you what, I said, you black guys over here, if any trouble ever arises, you're not black no more. You belong to Christian Tabernacle. You're a child of God. You are loyal to the Apostles' Doctrine. And that's true. If half the blacks walk off, those that love the truth ought to stay with the church. Amen. And I told them, I said, you that are white, you, you, you're not white no more. You're a Christian. You're a saint. You're a property of Jesus Christ in peculiarity. You belong to Him, Him only. You all sure do look at me funny. I don't know if I ought to appear tomorrow or not, considering the meanness I got up my sleeve in the morning. <laughs> Wow! Just bring your helmets and come on. Great peace. Now, in Second Corinthians 3 and 11, Sister Tenney, this, I want to point this out, what we were talking about yesterday about arts. 
2 Corinthians 3 and 11. Astute Bible scholars, according to certain commentaries that are common to you and me both, it's not something I know you don't know. If you read the commentaries, you've got the same statement. But a number of passages of Scripture in the Pauline epistles are thought to have been quotations from current songs. Now, they didn't have rock and roll in that day. They had something very, very different. You wouldn't have enjoyed their melodies, nor their harmonies, nor their beat. But you would have loved the lyrics. And music always changes from one traditional climate to another. And the people who are in that climate like it or dislike it. And people who are foreign to it find it very difficult to enjoy. Chinese music, it really doesn't make me want to get up and dance on the floor. It makes me want to ask where's mama. It scares the far out of me. You know? But if I was like this man, I'd like it. I'd have um, lots of Chinese music going. All right. This seems to have been one of the songs common in currency among all the saints. It may not have been. It might have just been that Paul was that poetic. But it seems that he was quoting one of the liturgy, one of the, one of the songs of the New Testament saints. May I have a reader? Read it slow and loud. No, nope, I gave you the wrong reference, Elder. Uh, I should have said 2 Corinthians 3 and 11. Well, I want it where it says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Thirteen. Read it, please. Now get that, you're reading too fast. Finally, common, comma, finally, comma, brethren, comma, farewell. Three words. All right. Finally, brethren, farewell. Okay. Continue to read. Be perfect. Be, perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. Read on. And the God of love and peace, what's the word? Will, shall, the determinate case. The God of love and peace will what? Okay, shall be with you. The degree of the power of God and the wonders and the miraculous that the elder was preaching about here last night, it would be helped if all the discord and the disharmony and the the apathy could go away from our personal relations with each other. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. And then he says, live in peace. Like fish live in water. Like we live in America. Live in peace. It does not say have pockets of peace about your experience. It does not say have 16 people that you do get along with in the district. I thought Vietnam War was over. I just felt one come by. Live in peace. In Him we live and move and have our being. Now you say, I'm not really bad about fighting. Well, half a teaspoon and a white cake will ruin it. You'll grieve away the Spirit of God, which is similar to a dove. You know doves are such peaceable little things. They just don't want loud clatter. They won't hang around operating machinery. They won't hang around loudly happy playing boys and girls. They don't hang around the schoolyards. They're out in the quiet fields, like the fields of blessed of God, like the field where Isaac reposed. The doves are where things are orderly and where things are peaceable and where there's not a constant threat of of, of, of evil. Can you draw two? 
Okay. Draw me that gearbox. Yeah. <clears throat> now get this. When sufficient supplies of perversity enter the mind, people call things by opposite names. The prophet said you call good evil and evil good. There's a way to meter significance. There are parameters to go by to measure what's right and what's wrong and what is significant and what is not. Okay, that's GMC, isn't it? Okay. (laughs) When you find people that always pick and tease, and who make no effort to be warmly supportive. I believe if you took a formal case, a formal course on this by any qualified instructor, he would tell you that this is the child of anger. Always teasing. Hi, fat gut. Well, I'm just teasing. I didn't mean anything by it. Yes, you did mean something. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The Scripture says, despise no man. It says, speak evil of no man. Let your conversation be seasoned with salt that you may add grace. Add grace to the hearers. Now, violence, uh, behavior... It's just one of these gears turned backwards. There are people in the marriage and in the home who, with enormous talent, can get a fuss going. It is because they hunger for love. They hunger for a touch. Now, I don't hold anybody responsible for this. And Brother Price stood here and said, uh, you know, he didn't know me and whatever I said wasn't his fault. Well, I heard that. <laughs> and so yeah, that's the way it is. This is. I'm saying this, but I'm just telling you what I believe. I believe there's not enough touching among God's people. Now, because there are homosexuals out on Westheimer Avenue, uh, we tend not to even hardly shake hands with a man no more. That's why I wear cowboy boots. I usually preach at them when I feel raunchy. I don't want nobody to think I'm a $3 bill. Mm -hmm. But there is some thought you ought not to really greet the brethren because of that, fully on that. There is a man love that is beautiful. Jonathan and David had that to the point the Scriptures say. It's there for your examination. Look at it, pathologist. Look at it, archaeologist, sociologist, doctor, whoever you are. Look at it. It said their souls were knit together. Now that word knit may mean a seamstress term, but I rather think it means a medical term. Bones, when they are knit together, are fused. They are welded. And the junction is stronger than the original bone. And I think that these men had so much going for themselves and they cultivated and helped that relationship along and they fertilized it and guarded it and defended it and loved it, painted it, kept it rubbed down, kept the brass polished on it. It was so good that the Scriptures say, do what you want to do with this, the Word of God, which has no impurities whatever. It's 100% perfect and pure. On every page, all the ink that got dry on there was right. And it said that the love that he had for this friend was sweeter than the love of a woman. There ain't a thing in God's world wrong of being slammed crazy about each other. But there's plenty of wrong about being indifferent and casual and distanced. From the other. Don't get my, the, my uh, transmission there yet. I'm going to turn the gear around. If a husband is not getting from his wife the things that are needed, 
And many of them start with an A. Acceptance, affection, appreciation, assistance toward achievement. If he's not getting that in the normal channels, if she is not responsible, if she's not responsive, he'll attempt to get it another way. A kiss on the forehead and a touch on the hand is very basically the same thing as a slap across the mouth. If you happen to get these things in here turned around backwards, what you want is touch. What you want is a transmission. There's another word I'd really like to use, but it wouldn't be proper because you wouldn't understand it in that context. But what is needed is to do with. Even with God, as distant as He seems, He is the one with whom we have to do. Your life is hungry for something to have to do. Uh, the story of life is uh, when you get born, you take the umbilical cord like that, you know, like a watch fob, and you run around finding some place to plug it back in again. It's a disaster to get cut loose from such love and support. There's a place to plug it in, and if you plug it in right, you're happy, and if you don't, you just got more problems. But we need each other. You hear me? We need the product. We need, the, we need the, uh, that that every joint supplies. It takes a joint. A joint is the putting it together of two pieces of pipe. It takes the, that that every joint supplies. Only when you get in a joint, and you, you get in a collar, a sleeve, or an L, or a, a junction, only when your pipe goes in, male and female and fitting, are you going to get a flow of the fluid. And so if a man can't get what he wants, the acceptance, why don't you be like your brother? Look how much money he's got. Why don't you be like my brothers? Look how tall and slender they are. Look at that bubble on you. That's not acceptance. But he wants that. He wants affection. There's no lumberjack so tough that he doesn't appreciate you sitting down in his lap and putting your hands around his neck and put your hand on his face and say, Daddy, I love you. You say, well, I didn't bash him to death. Do it three times and he'll just surrender. He needs that. He wants that. He may be psychologically bound and inhibited, but you need to unbind him if he is. Give it to him. He needs it. He'll die without it. He'll get crooked inside. He'll get lots of these little things in his radiator so that you can't hear him and he can't hear you. You can straighten out a lot of that radiator corrosion by pouring some love down the top. Love as an initiative. Love when love is not asked for. They're wanting it, but a lot of people cannot say, I need love. I want love. I want affection. I want achievement. I want acceptance. I want assistance. They won't say that. They cannot say that. I closed the funeral sermon uh, a while back. And I said that we're going now to the grave. It was a very, very difficult funeral. The kids were against each other. The mom and the daddy had had many, many troubles. But they were good people. It's just that they never had a pastor that taught them. They were sinners. And I said, as you walk away, you're going to wish a lot of times you'd said, Daddy, I loved you. I thought you were big. I thought you were great. Thanks, Daddy, for my shoes and my overalls and my shirts. You won them for me at the mill, the sweat of your brow, the sweat of your back and the pain of your legs. Thanks, Dad. And if you could hear him say as he... As you walked away, you'd say, Bye, son. I never really told you either that you brought me joy when you came. You were always pretty. I cared about you, and I was proud of the bees and the seas you made in reading. I never could. You did. Bye, son. There's a lot of things I never did say. That's the curse and the hellishness of life, is that we are too inhibited to say what we feel. And as far as touching is concerned, somebody said, well, if you touch that person, uh, I'm afraid they'll think sex. Do you touch your dog? <laughs> Do you rub the mane of a horse? 
Oh, come on, let's get off of that junk. Let's be in love. Live in love. Live in love. Swim in it. Sleep in it. Arise each day in love. I think I heard this from one of Brother Tenney's lessons about husbands and wives. That as older preachers, we keep hearing men say to us, well, I don't love her. Well, you must love her. You'll have to understand that when a wife was chosen for Isaac, he didn't even get to go on a trip. They didn't even say, you stay here at McDonald's, we'll go down here and get you one. They left him slam at the house. And they went down there and had this little gizmo with God about picking a woman out. It had something to do about drinking some water. And directly here she come back. And he said, that's it. And he said, I thank you. And that was it. Oh, this business said, well, I chose the wrong woman. I should have gone with more girls. Oh, that's sick. That's sick. When did God start looking out for you? When you first went to a one is Jesus name United Pentecostal Church altar? Oh, no. He cared for you before the mountains ever rose. Before the waters ever surged in the seas. God saw you. God cared about you. God chose the path of your feet. He chose the principal people in your world. The Lord God brought the woman unto the man. Do I appreciate what God did for me or do I appreciate what God did for me? I'd have never had the sense to pick out the magnificent, wonderful, beautiful, lovely, talented girl I got. God just brought her to me. Lucky. Oh, I could have been smart and said, well, I'll trade you in for two twenties. You know. They said this man came in with this woman half his age, said he was living. He was destroying all the fine and better things of life. You can love your wife. You've got to love her, not just abide by it. I like what it says, love America or leave it. I hate to see people blabbermouth this magnificent country, this glorious opportunity to be an American. I like it. And I've seen men that have uh, been in my office and said, I'm, I'm leaving her. I, I can't stand that no more. And I said, well, go ahead. What? I said, yeah, I've heard you say that the last three years. But I want to tell you what, there'll be a line of good-looking men that make plenty of money as long as from here to the post office lined up to get her when you leave her. She's a beauty. She's charming. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. If a person is of the Hatfield and McCoy rationale, if a person thinks that it's big sport to criticize the minister and his daughters and his sons and his wife, he may do that out of love. Not love he has, but love he wishes to have. I'm telling you that a stroke in affection is only first degree removed from a slap in the face. And if you don't know how to get a gentle hand, all the forces of your life and your living and the hungers of your inward soul cause you to opt from, for the optional, opt for the, uh, the other, a slap in the face. And so people that could be great lovers and enjoy life very much, when they come in the door and he brings his lunch pail in, she'd say, you're late again. He said, what business is that of yours? Well, I told you, you must be late again. He said, I run my own life. She said, what happened? Going to tell me this street had a red light in it. Blah, 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 blah. They're after it. If them two people could get these things here turned around backwards, you talk about making love. Go ahead and race it. All the way. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? There are people who live on and thrive on railing. Not head, stupid, crazy, bonehead, ignorant, hag. They, 
what are they doing? They've got these gears turned around. He said, but contrary lies return blessing for blessing. It should be, sweetheart, loved one, I care about you. Oh, you're doing good. I'd love to be with you. You're my favorite friend. We have more fun together. We talk. We understand. We love each other. We'll work our problems out. Just get them stupid gears turned around backwards, and you can go forward into your living if you're a peacemaker. Now, everybody can't be a peacemaker. Some people are too far over the cliff to ever come back. But there are people who can bring them back by being peacemakers. Let's look at some of the areas where peacemaking could be so very, very important. Uh, No, my notes remind me I need to go back and pick that up in Corinthians where he said, live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall, the determinate case again, the, the, the God of love and peace shall be with you. Uh, don't we all know that revival doesn't come where there's disharmony, suspicion, antagonisms, jealousies, disagreements, old fights? Chester Hensley said one time, he, he'd do anything. He said he went to a church in Indiana and put on the best he had and said it went over just like a lead balloon. He said, that ain't going to never work. Just back when he was young and had it. So he sought the Lord and the Lord showed him that there was two men in that church that was distressed at each other, that there were severe problems. And he wanted a revival earnestly, fervently, wanted a miracle. His philosophy was if he got one real uncontestable miracle, one obvious outflow, there it is, you can't deny it, miracle, that the revival was on the way. I think that's right. So he heard that this Brother Brown, this Brother Smith were like that. So he met Brother Brown in the prayer room and sat down by him, put his arm around him. That guy liked the attention of such a notable character, and they started talking. He said, you know, he said, uh, that Brother Smith over there, he, you all been in church together a long time? Yeah. Well, he said, I thought that because nobody could think as much of you as he does on a short acquaintance. I heard him say that uh, you were really, really a nice guy. Well, what Chester had done was outside he'd seen that guy, and he said, do you know so-and-so? And the fellow sarcastically said, yeah, he's a nice guy. So he moved the other end of the prayer room and found Smith down there, and he said, Oh, my God. He said, You know, I did meet that guy you told me about. You said he was really a nice guy. He is. And uh, he told me about you. He said, You know, that's one of the most faithful men this church has ever had. He stood by this pastor thick and thin. And he just had two little pieces on the keyboard but it was C and E, and they matched in the same key. And he, blah, 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 blah. he played that until music happened. And after church, well, these two fellas is making a squirrel hunt up together. Uh, that's just a little story. But I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit is bothered. He is grieved. He is pure. He is polite. He is sensitive. And he just can't stand human crap. That's what I said. I said that. Nobody's responsible for it but me. In the Old Testament, the warriors were given a weapon that no other military force or organization in the world had. The Israelis had a peculiar, separate, distinct weapon. If you found one today, the archaeologists could tell you this was an Israeli weapon. Because that Israeli weapon had not only its thrust for attack to pierce, but it also had a little shovel built into its handle. The purpose of that was that the Lord God said every day and every night, I will walk in the aisles of the tents of the warriors. I'm going to walk. I'm going to company with you. I'm going to visit with you. I'll spend my time amongst you, seeing about you, covering you up, seeing about you in the night. But he said, now, I don't want to walk through 
I'm not going to get that between my toes. I'll, I'll walk among you. But he said, you go beyond the camp. And when thou art relieved, you take that weapon, which is an integral part of your weapon. You take that little shovel and you cover that which has passed from your body. Now, you can't help but occasionally fail. And you have a stink quotient. But get sense enough to cover it up. I have a little time. I'm going slow here, so I'm going to go back here to Ahab and Jehoshaphat, getting that fixed up. By now, if you have antagonists in your life, if you have people that's giving you the devil, wearing you out, if you have people that are sandpaper quotients in your life, if you have people that don't like you, by now you should have thought of that. They should be looming up in your heart. The Holy Spirit should be examining your relationships with all the people in your phone book. It's critically important to make amends where there have been jealousies and hostilities and disagreements. I know the flesh would recoil from making reconciliation. But I know that my ability to own God O-W-N. My ability to own God, to appear before God, to have the right to plead in that court as a lawyer for my people. I know my rights before God are limited by whether or not I am crossed up with other Christians. Well, one brought a handsome offering to our blessed Lord and put it on the altar. And the Lord standing there said, It's pretty. You love me that much? You want to give me that? Oh, that's nice. Pretty. Always wanted that. And to think that you gave it, I, I, I love it. But he said, uh, Jack, come here. I want you to go over. And, you know, you got problems with this fellow across the mountain over here, across the levee. Uh, it ain't right. It's not smooth. It's not just. It ain't level. It ain't square. It's not plumb. Go patch that business up correctly and healthily. I'll wait. I want your offering, but I can't take it now. The scent is still in it. You're going to have to perfume that before I can take it home with me, boy. I just leave that out on the back porch the way it smells right now. But go get that fixed up. And then come. I'll be waiting. I'll take it. I want the offering. I want your continued worship, but there is a disruption of my ability to receive this. Because you and your brother are at loggerheads. You disagree. Okay, let's go back to units of life, okay? Let's say here that this is the vial of life. God gave you that. And let's say these are your tablets. You got one, two, three, four, five, six hundred units. Each one multiplied by a hundred. I believe I know people and I'm sure that you do too, who expend 100, 200, 300, 400, maybe 500 units of life trying to survive trouble. They send their motor vehicles, they send their helicopters, they send their landing uh, troop carriers, they send their trucks constantly after supplies to repair the damages that are done by combat. There are marriages that could produce magnificently talented and capable children, but the juices, the forces, the, the units of this have been absorbed by war, by suspicion, by jealousies, by hatreds. And God's against that. If I bought seven tons of fertilizer this morning, I called my manager and I said, I want these fields fertilized today. If he went to the bayou and stopped on the bridge and dumped in seven times 210, that'd be 1,400 and 
$1,470 worth of fertilizer. If he dumped that in that bar and I got home and found that pile of $1,470 worth of 12-24-12 in that creek, oh, now he'd be looking for another job. And God has given you X number of units of fertilizer to bless and green up the world with. And you can pull up to any kind of hole you want to. You can lose it over juice or wine. You can lose it over UPC or non-UPC. You can lose it over TV and what do you call that? Video. Now, I'm willing for this to be the last day. I've got an emergency in home. They want me to fly home anyway, but I want to tell you that you haven't got but just so much energy and so much force. And you could turn that if you could be peaceable. If you could understand the parameters of significance. What really means anything? What really means anything? What are the parameters of measuring and metering significance? Here's this little mother that is in rags mentally and emotionally because her daughter won't wear her glasses when she comes in from school. Look at you! You're not wearing your glasses. When will I ever, ever, ever get these kids raised? She's going to live what she's going to do. If she gets the cold, all it will produce is snot, and she's got Kleenex. So why, if it matters so little, make little of the matter? Yeah, I'll race it. I care about your feelings, and I don't want to offend you. I really do. I'm a sensitive person. I wish everybody here had been listening with even more ardent attention to Brother Tenney than we were last night. That man's carrying the mail. God's trying to send a revival to our world. I hate to see a man preach revival and have to labor and try to pull his crowd with him. I wish we'd all been on our feet waving our purses and waving our hands. Yeah. Go ahead, Elder. Revival's what we want. We want, we want to save the lost. Yeah. Well, I can't wait till tomorrow. I want, I want to get in that so bad. Oh, I want to make biscuits in the morning. I want to share with you something that's not at all original with me. I'll tell you where I got it. I got it from a sermon preached by William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. Did you know that was once a magnificent thing? You ought to read about that. He had a vision once. He said, he was an enormously evangelical person. He wanted to reach the lost. In moments, Moments, he could jump up on a park bench while the miners were coming out, waiting for the trains to go home, black with cold, tired, and aggravated, and ill-mannered, hurrying to the pubs to drink. He'd jump up there and preach him a magnificent sermon in a minute or two. He was so direct. He so cared about the human family. He moved thousands of lives. He said he had a dream. In the dream, he was at sea. He said there was a great storm characterized with unending blackness of clouds, fierce patterns moving in the clouds, and the waters, ill-mannered, wild, thrashing. And he said in his vision, he was standing on a rock island and he was on a little bit of a ledge. And that ledge was between him and this surging sea and a straight-up gray cliff of this great sea island. And he said a ship broke up in his dream. When the ship broke up, passengers, ladies, children, little children, 
men, strong men, young men, old men, rich men, poor men, slaves. The ship just burst apart, and in these horrible waters, they disintegrated and spread. Some clinging on a little something, some struggling, their lungs burning with exhaustion, trying to stay up, all of them, their hair wet and soaked and sobbed, and their eyes in the salt water, crying, Help me. Help me. Get my baby. That's my little girl. Get her. And this man Booth was standing on that little cliff, hardly more than his feet needed. And he said he stripped himself and went into the waters. And in his dream, himself became Christ. And he saw the blessed Galilean there, strong of shoulders and biceps and hands and muscles and swift and fervent and excited in rescuing these people. And he pulled an old man who had just about given up entirely. And he swam over and deposited him on that ledge. And then in his dream it seemed that there were other ledges a little higher and a little farther away and more generous where people could get. And he went back and he got men, he got women, he got little boys, not little girls. He got the sickly, the patients, the old, the aged. He got the simple-minded. He brought them back and he put them. And after a while he said the blessed Savior's chest heaved. He said his aliveness began to slip and decline. And he said to these people that he'd already rescued, Would you help me? There are many, many, many more. It seems like there are as many as when I started. Would you help me? And he said there were some up, way up there, and they had found a song book. And they were singing, In the sweet by and by. They said, No, we're thinking about heaven. We can't come down and help you. And he said he looked over and he saw one person uh, that was able-bodied, but he was crampled up. And uh, he, he was there alone, but uh, who could be a magnificent swimmer and a rescuer. And he says, would you help me, sir? Come, uh, go with me. Let's get some. And this person said, no, uh, I'm not happy enough. Uh, my salvation is not happy enough. I, I'm, I'm waiting on the Lord to minister to me. Uh, I need more. And he turned to other people over here, and they were arguing over predestination and election. And they were in a bare hole of fighting. And he said to these able-bodied people, able to wrestle one another, he said, would, would, would you come help me, sir? The blessed Lord, so strong and mighty, stripped to his waist in the water, having brought these people. And he said to these men over there who were debating predestination and election, said, would you, would you come? And they said, we don't have time. This is critically important. This has got to be settled. And I won't go on to the rest of the story because I think the whole crowd's caught it. I submit to you we're missing the point. I said all this belly aching and fighting and letter writing and telephone calling, blah, 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 he's just, 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 just politicking and electioneering and trying to remove incumbents and all that crap. What we ought to be doing is out here winning the lost, teaching home Bible lessons, having revivals, praying in the altar, seeking God, sending missionaries afar. Sending missionaries afar and sending home missions close. Now, I'm, I'm 52. You don't have to tell me that wasn't universally received. But I don't give a flip. That's what we need to be thinking. That the world is crying for rescue while we debate with each other, while we argue with each other, while we have this us and them situation over any number of issues of limited significance when viewed from the sea wreck. What are the parameters of significance? There are people who are so determined Determined that it's got to be this way. Like two neighbors down here fighting over a four inch line where this right of way comes. But seen from a satellite, we do well to see California coast. But these citizens are not going to give two inches apiece. They're not going to settle this like loving neighbors who are interested in each other's welfare, they're going to go to court. They're going to ask for Melvin Belli. I want to tell you that the human heart that has an enormous and heavy 
craving for love for just a little bit will be satisfied to fill that same craving if the gears turn back with hate. If you don't believe that, you just if you're a farm boy, you ask yourself what happens when marriage come in season. The god awfulest fighting and carrying on, if you know, if you've ever owned a real stallion that's worth up into six figures, you just don't bring a mare like that. That mare may kick his leg where you'll have to kill that horse. She may so bite his face and his ears and his back. Oh, it's hell on earth. You know what cats do, don't you, in the alley at night? It's not, I love you. It had to be you. Wonderful you. Nobody would do. It had to be you. It's... There ain't much difference, son. The result's the same. Sixteen kittens. <laughs> May I have a reader? First Thessalonians five thirteen. And then another reader, please, Hebrews 12, 14. And I will be through. Now we're talking about leadership here in the church, to esteem them very highly. Maybe you'd better read the verse before that, reader, would you, to get, get the connotation? Now hold right there, brother. To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Uh, there are probably new Christians here today, and if no one's got to you with this, I want to be the first. Your utilization of your pastor's powers depends on your outlook towards him. He can do you so much good. He can bless you. He can purify you. He can make you a polite and gracious and good and productive person if you love him, if you care for him, if you have affection for him. On the other hand, if you don't care for him, if you're not in love with the man of God, he can expend enormous voltage and your light won't even flicker. Okay, I'll get this for me, brother. I'm, I'm going to go back again. I, I don't feel relieved of something here in this audience. All right, let's say that this is a human being and this is a spinal column. I'd like to thank the medical term. It slipped me here just a minute. Do you know what I've told you, Brother Davis? I'll get it. Have you got it written down in the notes? Yes, how'd you know that? You're a medical student? Oh, you put it up here, okay. Thank you. You blessed me. I know the devil don't like you for that, but I do. At the base, or uh, the point of junction, you'll find this in Life and Time Encyclopedia of the Human Body. At the base of the junction between the ends of the spinal cord column and the orifices and entrance, entrance of the brain, there is a reticular formation. It's smaller than the butt of this microphone and about two inches long. It is so full of nerves and blood vessels that this word reticular here is where it gets its name. It's like a web or a woven cloth. Uh, the the, it's like this. In order to get all that in there, you've looked under the hood of a new Cadillac and you say, well, man, there's not room enough to put a toothpick under there left. There's so many things under there. Uh, you're like that. 
All of you have what is known in medical science as a, the reticular formation. Okay, get this. There are 300,000 stimuli which reach you in any second of your waking day. I don't know what the figure is, but it's less than that that reach you during your sleep time, something like 40,000 stimuli that are reaching you, reaching your gray matter, your crania, your brains. Have your socks slipped down? You say, well, I don't know. No, you don't need to know. But you don't even need to look. You can feel it. If they're down around your ankles, now that you call for that information, you know. Okay? That's the work of the reticular formation. It would not be profitable or possible or sensible for 300 stimuli to reach your brain. You couldn't handle all them in your subconscious ability to choose. Uh, through your ability to smell, there are many, many odors and scents in this room that you do not smell. You're not smelling me, but a Doberman could. He could tell the difference between me and anybody in this room. If you were to take my vest off and give it to a bloodhound and let me go seven miles through the desert, a bloodhound probably could find me because he is able to distinguish between the very delicate differences between the odors of my body and any other person in this room. His reticular formation, which dogs have too, is letting that through. Understand that? You've all had experiences with that when you get to thinking about it because you've got one, you've had one since you've been here, and you'll have one till you die. It's working. Uh, God has allowed this magnificent gift of the body to not let you be bombarded. For instance, the, the family of the fireman that lives in the firehouse. When the bell goes off, the mother sleeps right on through, the baby sleeps right on through, and that fireman comes plummeting out of the bed, grabs his clothes down the hole, down the pipes. He isn't out on the streets, and after a while he comes back, and after he's fought that fire, he eases himself back in the bed not to disturb her. She didn't hear nothing. And you know what happens, too, when the baby cries? What does the fireman do, this brave, strong, capable man? <laughs> He don't hear one thing. I had a preacher in my home one time. They had three babies, and one of them was very young and not adjusted yet. And uh, he got up the next day, and I said, How'd you do, Brother Kenneth? You slept well last night? He said, I'm telling you, God's blessed us with the best baby we've ever had. He said, That little thing laid there all night without even hardly breathing. And I saw Martha say, <laughs> She was a night-soaked, red-eyed tail walker from trying to take care of that baby. But as far as he was concerned, he never heard nothing. That is the use of the reticular formation. Uh, I was looking for a boat trailer here a few weeks ago for the farm, and I could see boat trailers under oak trees, sweet gum trees, pine trees. I could see them in wrecking yards. I could see every boat a trailer on a lot because I was interested in one. Understand how that goes? If you want a little red Ferrari, you say, boy, I, I want something nobody's got. And you go buy your red Ferrari, and when you've had it three weeks, the world is full of them. <laughs> because you have an interest. And that's the word I want to write down next is interest. You have an interest. Let me give you this little formula. What we give attention to indicates our intention. What we give our attention to indicates our intention. The president of General Motors built a very beautiful home in Dearborn, Michigan. And an old friend who was a psychology major at a university came by and visited him, and he saw in his home a real work of art. It was from Thailand. It was a handmade, huge, beautiful cage. Oh, just quite large, quite impressive, but delicately woven. And he said, uh, where's the bird? And the car man said, there ain't no bird in there. He didn't say ain't. Uh, the man said, well, <clears throat> what do you got it here for? He said, it's in Thailand. I love the people. I wanted to remember the trip. I saw this thing, and uh, uh, 
I wanted it, and I paid a lot of money for it, and I got it here, and it just reminds me of my trip and of other people in the world. I want it, and it's hanging there. He said, you'll have a bird in it before long. The man said, no, I don't want one of them nasty, chirping little devils in here. I don't want it. I don't, I don't have no bird in there. And the man, <clears throat> the psychologist major, said, you will. Oh, he said, no, I'm not going to have a bird. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 100 against $500, and next time I come to see you, there'll be a bird in that cage. Well, he said, let's go to the desk drawer. Put your five in, I'll put mine in. And they did. And when the psychologist came back, there was a bird in that cage. The subconscious desire for a bird motivated that man to buy a beautiful cage. What he was showing attention to revealed an unfathomable intention. Can you believe that or not? I don't care. But I know when you are running after the things of the world and wishing they weren't wrong, you'll get one. Boy, I'm going to tell you this human heart, you need to guard it carefully. It'll fool you. It'll deceive you. Oh, how we need each other's caution. How we need each other's preaching. How we need each other's care. How we need each other's love. Because it's very difficult to keep that. Amen? About revival. About revival. My son is deeply involved in his a strong desire for revival. I think he has a special thing. He said uh, he's an associate pastor and we, it takes all all of us can do to give the saints a fair shake. Some weeks ago he said, Dad, I've got these calls. Churches in other areas that don't have revival and they've heard about it and they want to go. Do you think I, I want to go? I really feel like I ought to see what it's like. I said, I, I, by all means, I want you to go. Go now. And he came back crestfallen he said dad it's incredible he said you can give everything you've got and the people who said they just kind of look at you and wonder where you came from and when you get sinners in the altar he said it's the most unhandy thing in the world to get between the sinners and the saints who are seated in the pews none of them come and pray and try to pray four or five people through at one time. And you've got to do it, he said, because if you say you're going to do it and fail, then your credibility is gone. He said, it's kind of hard to keep this one praying long enough to get over there to him and pray these through. Uh, and then he made this remark. He said, you know, I don't feel like that much of what I left for him will ever come to fruit. I said, it won't, Randy. This reticular formation will not let you learn how to have a breakthrough and double your church in 90 days and reach into other strata, socioeconomic strata and races of the people until you want to bad enough. When you want to buy a boat trailer, you can see them anywhere. When you want a red Ferrari, you can see red Ferraris on every lot you pass. But the thing that seems to me like detonates and opens and regulates this uh, reticular formation is desire. You know, when you're four, you don't like the girls. And when you're five, it's a different story. The reticular formation begins to come around here, see? And as far as revival is concerned, until we get to where we understand that Christ tasted death for every man. Until we understand that everybody is somebody. That the rich and the poor, the educated, the simple, everybody is dear and precious to that young man there in the water. You know, we talk about worldwide revival. You know, we're talking about the Thais. We're talking about the Cubans. We're talking about the Chinese. We're talking about Muslim states. We're talking about communist states. We're talking about industrialized uh, Western Europe and here in the United States we're talking about blacks Vietnamese Chinese Cambodians Mexicans whites ex-convicts singles
But until we want, want, want revival. I'm not talking about a little more tires on Monday morning. I said, I'm not talking about a little more ties on Monday morning. I'm not talking about getting pretty high up on the list of the Sunday school director's report. I'm talking about saving barbers, plumbers, taxi drivers, farmers, medical personnel, paralegal people, other preachers. It's a fascinating, dumb thing we've done. We've ignored the best talent in America, the preachers. We avoid them as if they had leprosy and AIDS. That's not what the apostles did. They went for the, well, they went for the gizzard and got Apollos. They got years and years and years and years ahead. They got somebody with know-how, talent, personality, force, eloquence, power of the scriptures. I'm sorry for the many, 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 many mistakes I've made in my life. I'd like to live over again. I'd go through the whole pushing caboodle if I could, if I knew then a little more than I knew now. I'm not through, you know, but I've got another shot tomorrow if I live and you live and you come back here tomorrow. I'm going to pull the rubber band back and have plenty of spit on the bob. Let's go. Let's have revival. Let's turn this world to God. Let's turn this world to God. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand and pray. Ask God to let the revival come to your heart and your life.